Welcome to our, the next session in our Privilege, Race, and Religion series. Uh, I'm Mark Fowler, uh, CEO at the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and for those of you who may be watching the recording, thank you for accessing our work. Uh, I'd like to first start by uh, acknowledging uh, the land on which I am sitting. So I am in Brooklyn, New York. And I am uh, sitting on the traditional land of the Munse Lenape people, uh, land that is now known as uh, New York, that has a history of um, misappropriation at the very least. Um, but I do want to acknowledge the land that I'm on, the ancestors from this place, and hope that they will look favorably upon the work that we're doing today. I also wanted to acknowledge our funders and our supporters for this effort, the Walt Disney Company for their support of this series, as well as our partners at the Boniak Institute at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Uh, also, as part of the ongoing series we've been doing, I do want to acknowledge um, everyone who may be experiencing something related to COVID-19, whether that is a illness within your family or your friend's network, um, or you are a first responder yourself in some way and or are connected to first responders. We just want you to know that we are thinking about you throughout this time uh, and hope that you remain well. And finally, uh, just to mention that this is a series that we've put together um, looking at, if you will, the paradox of the fingerprint that religion has on the creation and the sustaining of systems of inequity and racism, and at the same time being able to highlight and investigate and perhaps model some of the work that is being done by some of those same institutions around anti-bias and anti-racism work within religious and spiritual communities around the country. Uh, I also need to uh, remind everyone that uh, you have access to both the chat box. There will be a portion of this conversation where you're able to ask questions and we ask you to put them in the question and answer uh, box. And that uh, we invite you to share about this experience on our social media handles. You can find us uh, at Tannenbaum Center on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And we also use uh, the hashtag include religion, all one word, include religion, and encourage you to do so. So now with all of the, hopefully all of the housekeeping done, I want to welcome um, our guest and our friend today, uh, Robert P. Jones, uh, CEO and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute. Um, before I talk about his formal bio, um, Robbie is just a, a great person, an incredible thought partner. Uh, we partnered with Public Religion Research Institute on the survey that we did uh, in 2013, exploring the uh, experiences of American workers and religious bias in the United States. And we find that that data is still providing and proving to be uh, important in conversations around equity, both in the workplace and in other industries. But a little bit of Robbie's formal um, bio, he's the author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, which we'll be discussing in detail today. He is also the author of The End of White Christian America, which won the 2019 Raw Mayor Award in Religion. Uh, Robbie writes regularly on politics, culture, and religion for The Atlantic Online, NBC Think, and other outlets. He's frequently featured in major national media, such as CNN, MSNBC, NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, pretty much anything that's written. Um, Robbie also serves on the National Program Committee for the American Academy of Religion and is a past member of the editorial boards for the Journal of the American Academy of Religion and Politics and Religion, a journal of the American Political Service Association. He holds a PhD in religion from Emory University and MDiv from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. 
and a BS in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College. And Jones was selected by Emory University's Graduate Division of Religion as a Distinguished Alumnus of the Year in 2013 and by Mississippi College's Mathematics Department as Alumnus of the Year in 2016. Um, so welcome. So good to see you. So good to be in conversation with you, Robbie. Oh, thanks, Mark. It's so, um, yeah, I'm so glad to be here with you today. So I actually wanted to start um, because your work is um, obviously very well revered and your research work is very well revered, but there's a very personal relationship that you have to this work and that comes through very clearly in the book White Too Long. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your personal mission statement and how it is that, how does that inform this body of work as well as your commitment through Public Religious Research Institute, your books, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks. Um, well, you know, I, I should say this work, I think has really always been somewhat personal to me. I mean, I, I grew up uh, someone who uh, was at church all the time. Uh, I grew up in uh, mostly in Mississippi, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, and I grew up Southern Baptist. Um, and, uh, and my extended family actually goes back uh, six generations, actually a little bit more than that, in middle Georgia, all right? So uh, my roots on both sides of my parents uh, are actually in Bibb County, Georgia, and uh, I am actually the first generation of my family in 200 years not to live in middle Georgia. Um, so it goes way, way back, and um, lots of Baptist preachers and stuff, uh, you know, all the way back. So it's, it's been, I think, very personal to me. We were also very active um, growing up in, in the church. I was that kid even through my teenage years, I was at church four or five times a week. I mean, pretty much any time it was open, I was there. <laughs> I went to Baptist college, you know, I went to, I have a degree from a Baptist seminary. So this is all very much, um, you know, one time I was thinking about going into the ministry before I went into the, um, into um, the academy. Uh, so this is all very, you know, very personal to me. But I, but I think, you know, this last book in particular, that's looking at this intersection of um, of the role that that white Christianity in particular has played in sustaining uh, white supremacy in the country it is also very very personal, particularly as someone who's grown up as a Southern Baptist in the South. And just one quick anecdote: I mean, I, I think um, that I think tells you like, like part of the power I think of of um, kind of white Christianity I grew up with is that it has kind of hidden uh, this legacy. Um, and so, mm. for example, even though I was at church all that time. Uh, as a as a kid, it wasn't until I was in my early twenties um, that I knew anything about um, the origin story. Um, you know, you began with this land acknowledgement. You know, in this in this session, um, I could not have even done a basic history acknowledgement of my own denomination. You know, growing mm -hmm. up, and and you know, just to put it bluntly, I mean, the you know the the origins of my home denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, were that in 1845, um, the Baptists in the South broke apart from the Baptists in the North, uh, largely, or not largely, but uh, principally over the, the issue of slavery. Um, and it was uh, the question that really broke uh, the fellowship between Northern and Southern Baptists was uh, whether or not um, it was legitimate for a minister of the gospel, and particularly one who was being appointed to the mission field, um, to uh, enslave other people on the basis of the color of their skin. And Baptists in the North rejected that idea. Um, and Baptists in the South were so committed to that idea and that compatibility between uh, owning other human beings and the gospel that they formed their own denomination um, really in, in order to um, cement these two ideas together. Um, and, you know, this is not any fringe or, um, you know, denomination. It, it actually, that my home denomination, Southern Baptist, became the dominant expression of Protestant Christianity in the country. Uh, by the mid-20th century, it was the largest Protestant denomination of any kind um, mm -hmm. in the country. So it wasn't some fringe thing. I mean, it became, the denomination with that history became the dominant expression of white Christianity in the country. Yeah. It's so fascinating, and I, I think that this this is a good foundation, a good place to talk a little bit about distinguishing between theology and conduct, um, because you, you, when we talk, when we look at that history, not just of the Southern Baptist tradition, but of a variety of traditions, not just Christian for that matter, that there is this distinction, if you will, between Christian theology 
and then the conduct of Christians. And it seems that in the book you are trying to um, make some comparisons and some uh, distinguishing between those things. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, so we've been talking about, you know, I think the conduct, and I, I want to emphasize a point you just made, and that is that even though sort of, you know, the book kind of starts uh, uh, because it's it's part memoir, really. So this this most recent book starts with my experience as a Southern Baptist and kind of that history. Um, what's notable, really, is that um, while that may be one of the more extreme examples, um, uh, but every major Protestant denomination split over the issue of slavery um, in the mid-19th century. Um, you know, the Methodist split, the Presbyterian split, uh, the Episcopalian split. Um, and I think while I think most of the time many, many may associate holding more racist attitudes with Southern uh, evangelical religion. Uh, it's worth remembering that, you know, Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis were Episcopalians, right? They weren't Baptists, they were Episcopalians. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so, it, and, and it wasn't until the 20th century that, that these, um, I mean, the Presbyterians don't come back together um, until the 1980s um, after that split um, in mm -hmm. the Civil War. So this goes well into the 20th century before these fences are kind of mended and, and these denominations kind of come back um, together. But, you know, what I would say is that um, th the thing that I, I think became clear to me in the, in the historical work uh, for the book is that, in fact, theology um, followed function um, for many of these white Christian denominations. And, and what, what ended up happening is that the formation of theology um, really um, operated with a pre-commitment to uh, the, to white supremacy. And I'm going to say just a quick word about what I mean by that, because I think often when we hear the word white supremacy, we think, oh, this is people in sheets and burning crosses and throwing bricks at civil rights workers. That's what we mean by, but, but um, I'm going to follow uh, Professor Eddie Galloud at Princeton here, who had this great phrase, um, that, you know, that what we really need to understand is uh, what, what he called white supremacy without all the bluster. Um, right. Um, so beyond the sort of violent extremism, uh, there is a much more subtle uh, yet pernicious um, form of, of white supremacy that really just gets down to the very basic idea that there is some superiority uh, to uh, white people over others. Right. That's the really fundamental definition uh, there. And, and I think what became clear is that um, even after the abolition of slavery, that this idea that whites were a superior race, um, and it, in fact, were divinely created as a superior race, this is very much connected to a theological worldview, um, was, was quite pervasive. Um, even among abolitionists, um, this idea um, was, was, was pretty firmly in place. It was actually one of the things that Frederick Douglass, after the Civil War, was quite dismayed at how quickly, you know, wh whites across the Southern and, and Northern lines could um, uh, kind of put you know, let bygones be bygones over the issue of slavery. But one of the ways that they were able to do that is that they still shared this idea that whites were really meant to be at the top of the political, social, cultural pyramid and everyone else, indigenous people, African-Americans, any other people of color were meant to be sort of under uh, that. And that, that commitment was that, that was very explicit, you know, is with us all the way up through the civil rights movement in the, in the 1920s, the protection of segregation. Um, and, and theology really did follow form. And so there were these, um, I don't know how much you want to get into it, but I mean, there were very explicit theological constructs um, that were um, built uh, really to protect this idea of white, of white supremacy. I think it is worth going into a little bit because I do think that to your point, when we talk about privilege, when we talk about white supremacy, there really still is this idea of um, the way we talk about it is Tannenbaum in terms of the 10 bias danger signs is that there's both subtle and overt expressions of discrimination or bias. And usually when people think about religion overall, they think about the most overt, the most um, extreme and extraordinary circumstances. So take us, in, take us a little bit into the, the theology and the where we see kind of like that uh, convergence of the idea of the supremacy of white people and how that actually shows up. Um, well, you know, it, it, again, it was kind of all part of a world, a kind of hierarchical worldview, and it was read back into the biblical text in a couple of ways. Um, you know, one one way quickly from the um, the Hebrew Bible um, or the Christian Old Testament, 
it was read literally back into the creation story in the book of Genesis. So right, read all the way back. And, um, you know, it was uh, uh, kind of two forms of it, the curse of Ham or the curse of Cain, that in both cases, um, the way this, this went is that, you know, the emergence of non-white people in the world was attributed uh, to uh, essentially an initial criminal act um, by an early human being. So in the case of Cain and Abel, it is the story of Cain who murders his brother Abel um, uh, because he's jealous of him. And then he lies to God about it uh, when, when he's confronted in the text. And what the text says is that, um, that, that God marked him, um, but it doesn't say anything about race or skin or any of that. But, but white Christian theologians took that passage and said, aha, this is the origin of non-white people in the world, black and brown people um, in the world. And what that does, of course, is that it means that the um, origin story of whites goes back to Adam and Eve and to these two beings that God uh, breathes life into and forms with God's own hands. But the origin story of black and brown people goes back to a criminal act, right, of murder um, in this case. And so it sets up an understanding of a kind of moral superiority, even in the reading of the text of the creation story back then. And then the other uh, piece of it that's a little more subtle that I think still survives very much today is um, a, a, an understanding of salvation um, that's hyper individualistic, right? And that really does mean that it narrows the beginning and the end of religion into this idea of having a personal relationship with Jesus. So like, for example, growing up, um, Southern Baptist. There was not a religious service that I went to. I, I think it is literally true that every uh, worship service, I would have heard the phrase having a personal relationship with Jesus in some form or other. What I heard absolutely nothing about uh, growing up, and I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I actually experienced uh, the desegregation of our public schools. It didn't happen to the early 70s in, in Jackson, 20 years after Brown v. Board of Education. But, but even with all that going on, um, I heard absolutely nothing about civil rights. I heard not one sermon or teaching um, about the origins of our denomination or about our silence um, at best and worst complicity in upholding uh, Jim Crow laws and, and resisting uh, uh, the desegregation efforts in the South, nothing on any of that. And, and the way that that worked is with this emphasis on this personal relationship with Jesus as all you should really be worried about um, as a white Christian, it meant that it, it literally limited your, your moral vision. Um, mm -hmm. that, that as long as me and Jesus were okay in some interior fashion, um, everything going on outside, I could be completely oblivious to. And King, you know, I think had this great phrase that goes right to this. And that is, you know, when he was writing a letter from Birmingham jail and he was wondering where are all the white Christians and why aren't they standing up, you know, for issues of racial justice. Um, here and he was writing to the more respectable uh, people, um, uh, you know, not not the fringe, you know, people again, but the kind of upstanding civic leaders in the in the town. And he said, you know, who are these white Christians sitting safely behind the anesthetizing their anesthetizing stained glass windows? So this idea that the, the way that Christian theology functioned was actually to anesthetize or blunt uh, white Christian consciences to the claims of. Uh, racial justice all around them, I think has been one of the most powerful things uh, that has happened inside of white Christian churches. Wow. Well, you do a great job of connecting history to the, the current moment. And I think that this also speaks to your work as a researcher and as a member of the academy. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, because I think that there still is this experience that we're only talking about either the, the wishes or the desires or needs of the evangelical community. And to a certain degree, the evangelical community is even being stereotyped in terms of the percentage of people who actually are um, in favor of one policy over another or are taking, issue, taking uh, steps around anti-bias or anti-discrimination work. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the trends that you are seeing and how they relate to uh, this idea of the supremacy of whites or white supremacy impacting Christianity as a tradition. Yeah, well, again, I'll kind of go back to this point that I think we should just make over and over is that this is not just a Southern issue or problem. It's not just a white evangelical uh, problem uh, or issue. And I think this is one of the things that became um, so clear to me and working on the book. And particularly when we look at 
at contemporary attitudes, right? So not just way back uh, historical attitudes, but I, I was interested in connecting this history to see, well, how does this still live with us today? How is this still in our DNA, um, you know, within white Christianity? And again, not just among white evangelicals who are, um, you know, in the South, but among white mainline Protestants who are kind of more, their center of gravity is more in the Midwest and even um, uh, white Catholics who have more urban um, history of, uh, you know, in, in the Northeast, uh, for example. So, but even in all three of these traditions, um, you know, these, these things are still there. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, uh, so, you know, in, in the book, I, um, I set out to measure um, kind of structural race, attitudes around structural racism in the book. And what I mean by that is not just personal attitudes, like do I feel warmly toward someone of a different race uh, or not, but like, how do I think about things like um, uh, things that have been in the headlines uh, here, the killing of African-American men by police. Um, do, I, do I see that as a pattern, um, the way that African-Americans are insisting that it is, or do I just dismiss it um, as a kind of one-off, you know, bad, bad apple kind of thing? Um, Confederate monuments, Confederate flags, um, the continuing uh, 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 resonance of um, past discrimination on current economic mobility among African Americans, for example. So when I looked across all of those things, I, I built what I called a racism index in, in the book. And um, that's a, it's a collection of attitudes across 15 different questions like that. Um, and what was remarkable about that is that when I scaled this index from one to 10, with 10 holding more racist attitudes and one holding least racist attitudes. And what was remarkable um, is, is how close all white Christian groups scored on that index toward the high end um, and how different those attitudes were among whites who weren't Christian, right? That gap was really big. Um, and so just for example, on that scale of one to 10, um, white evangelicals scored eight out of 10 um, on the racism index of holding more racist attitudes. Um, that may not be so surprising given you know, the history of, um, of that group uh, from which I come again. Uh, but what was notable is that white mainline Protestants scored seven out of 10. Now that's Episcopalians, Presbyterians, United Church of Christ, Methodists, um, and white Catholics also scored seven out of 10 um, on that index. And if you look at whites without, uh, who are not Christian, they only score four um, out of 10. So this, you know, and even when I looked underneath and we're looking at um, uh, what kinds of things might contribute to this, um, other alternative explanations for this gap between white Christians and white non-Christians, um, even when I controlled for, you know, everything I could basically think of, partisanship, education levels, region of the country, gender, education levels, and when I controlled for all these factors, this difference still stood up, right, which what that means is the conclusion is that it is the Christian identity piece of this that is doing the work. Uh, it's not age, it's not region, it's not partisanship. I mean, it really is the Christian identity uh, piece of this uh, uh, doing the work. And um, I, I think that that's really telling that this is a, it, it is something tied to Christian, kind of white Christian identity um, that, that we're still dealing with today. And, tell, and it kind of helps you locate the problem, right? That, that the problem still is in um, this kind of legacy that white Christians have kind of brought forward um, you know, from our past and this kind of, you know, what was first an explicit, um, a, uh, explicit defense of the supremacy of whites over others then became kind of more implicit. But what has never really happened is it's never really been fully deconstructed. So it's just carried forward uh, with us. I mean, something that was constructed over centuries has kind of carried forward and you can still see it, um, you know, measured in. And again, question after question, it's not just one question, but a whole range of questions show this same pattern uh, that we're still struggling with today. So it's really interesting. Could you just give us an example of like what are one or two of the questions that made up yeah. this racism index so that people have a yeah. frame of reference for this? Yeah, so one of them, you know, I, I mentioned uh, just closely, but uh, it's worth noting that um, on the question of the killing of African American men by police, for example, we have a question where, that asks, do you see the killing of African American men by police um, as um, uh, a, a part of a broader pattern of how police treat African Americans, or you do see these as just isolated incidents. And white Christians of all kinds, again, evangelical, mainline, and Catholic, um, are about uh, 30 percentage points more likely uh, to say they see them as isolated incidents rather than part of a pattern compared to whites who are unaffiliated. A uh, very similar thing on the Confederate flag. If you ask about do you see the Confederate flag as a, you know, primarily a symbol of racism or a, a symbol of Southern pride? Um, white Christians are about twice as likely as whites who are not Christian to say they see it as Southern pride. Uh, 
uh, yeah. rather than a symbol of racism. And in both of those cases, you know, if you ask the question, so who is the close among whites, who is the closest to the concerns and worries of African Americans? It's not white Christians, right? It is whites who are religiously unaffiliated are much closer to the views of, um, of, of African Americans on these, on these questions in the country. So, I mean, one way to boil it down is to say, look, if you take your average white person and you add Christian identity, they actually move further away from the concerns of African Americans than closer. And so, you, so I'm, I'm having a thought now and I'm gonna try and put this into a, a question that makes sense. <laughs> All so, right, go for it. <laughs> I'm gonna do my best. So I think one of the things that, in terms of looking for ways for people to be responsible, take action, but also to not per se be wounded by um, this history, which seems to be relatively unknown, or you have to kind of dig to find within your own tradition in the foundational documents and the charter, things that we never pay any attention to. I, I want us to try and distinguish a little bit between um, the influence of supremacy on Christianity that then becomes a part of this system that people are just operating in and they're unaware. And the experience of uh, actual conscious, willful dismissal of information. And I wonder if it, it does this, one, does this question make any sense? And because I think it would be helpful for us to dis, to distinguish system and process from experience. Because you, you, know, you kind of come into a system, you're born into a system, and yeah. then you just kind of, start, you are socialized and you operate inside of it that you don't know anything any different. And then when someone yeah. says, hey, there's something a little bit different, what's the propensity for actually leaning into it? it might be a little bit different or there's no way it can be well you know i think this kind of goes to the heart of why i wrote the book you know i mean you know so i'm 52 years old i was born in 1968 um and again like you know i experienced you know things like um yeah the first black kids showing up at my elementary my public elementary school um, I experienced the KKK demonstrating outside soccer fields that I was going to in middle school. Um, I went to a high school that was, our, our mascot was Colonel Reb. I mean, we, we, it was again, public integrated high school, but half white, half black, um, very integrated. Uh, but our, our, our football team, you know, when we scored a touchdown, the band played Dixie uh, and a white cheerleader ran up and down the field with a Confederate flag. I mean, you know, these were such overt uh, things and yet, um, I, I think um, I was so socialized, I think that's the right word, inside of, you know, this white Christian church that these never appeared as things to be interrogated, right? Mm -hmm. They just never appeared as questions. And, and, and like, looking back on it now, I mean, it, that almost sounds fantastical to say, right? It's like, wow, really? It was that overt mm -hmm. and you never thought to interrogate it? But I think that's actually worth noting, right? And that, yeah. that I, I think it is, you know, part of the, the challenge is that um, white Christians in particular, I think, have been, you know, they have been brought up inside of. And so if you ask me, like, what benefits did, you know, being a member of a church like that convey on you? I could name all kinds of positive, you know, benefits from feeling supported to being in community to feeling like people would celebrate my successes and help pick me up when I fell down. I mean, there's all kinds of positive things. Um, but it also had this role of like really um, uh, uh, kind of depriving me of a bigger moral vision you know, at the same time. And I think being able to tell these complex truths um, about, yes, what are the positive things that religious organizations bring? I mean, they build hospitals, you know, take my town in Mississippi, there are hospitals that are built, there are orphanages that were built, there are relief agencies that, you know, pick up and go at the drop of the right. hat when a tornado hits. I mean, there's all these kinds of positive things. Mm -hmm. And yet, it is also true um, that, uh, that at the same time those things were going on, um, there was this support for this fundamental idea of white supremacy that, that limited, I think, um, kind of moral vision. Um, it, it, it occluded moral vision and, and it, it kind of prevented us from, I think, being um, particularly in relationship with African Americans in our, in our communities because we, we literally could not see or hear uh, mm -hmm. the things that they were that they were raising, and we were unwilling to. We were happily, I think, kind of a little 
a bit unable to see or hear those things. Um, cause, cause the thing is they're, they're troubling, right? If, if you, you find yourself on that, on that end of it. But I think the, the beginning of this is, is a couple of things. One is to realize, I think for, for white Christians that, um, this is not an altruistic project at the end of the day, um, kind of telling the truth about this history, but it's really about healing our own faith communities and bringing them into a better place of health. Um, you can't really have a healthy community, um, when you have so many things that are still built around an idea that really many people would explicitly reject, right? But the fact that it has been built around white supremacy um, means that things in the faith are, they're a little, they're disfigured and they're warped. And so trying to kind of deconstruct that is a, I think a method of handing a more holistic, healthier faith down to our kids and our, and our grandkids. I mean, that we, we have, we white Christians have something deeply at stake um, in this. It's not just an altruistic move to right past wrongs. It's really about bringing our own communities into a better place of health. It's both of those things. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really great. Um, the, you talk a lot in the book about uh, the post-Civil War and this whole idea of the lost cause ideology. And you've spoken a little bit about this in terms of kind of what was the water that you might have been swimming in and growing up in, uh, in Mississippi. And I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about where, what, what would the language be today? So there's the lost cause ideology, but what would we call that today? And what um, does it, in, what, how can it inform the conversations of the day around equity and justice and um, the soul of a, a religious tradition? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think one of the, the most visible really direct things that we still have uh, among us are Confederate monuments um, and, the, and the kind of lingering presence of the Confederate battle flag. I mean, these were very much a uh, part of what was called the lost cause, um, you know, um, efforts uh, post-Civil War. And it was really about preserving these Confederate values, right? And kind of glamorizing and glorifying these Confederate values. I'll give you just one um, you know, one example is um, in Richmond, um, there was this is a kind of massive monument. This is actually the statue has now been removed just of this past summer, but uh, there was this massive monument to Jefferson Davis, right? The, the first president of the, of the Confederacy um, there, uh, who, by the way, was a, um, a, an Episcopalian uh, in good standing. Uh, and a, a, there's a Episcopalian church in Richmond that actually has his likeness embedded in um, a couple of stained glass windows um, in, their, in their church, um, you know, still today. Um, but 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 this this monument was built um, there and it's massive, you know, but it was in the middle of a traffic circle on a main thoroughfare in Richmond. It was there to like, like remind people like we lost the war, but here are these these values that we stood for, these Confederate values that were really uh, around white supremacy, the defense of slavery. Um, we still hold these and we actually think um, that we're going to be vindicated. And in fact, if you look at that particular monument, there's a statue of Jefferson Davis, but much higher than that is a big column. It goes up five stories. At the top of that column is a gold figure of a woman um, whose finger is pointed at the sky like this. And under that uh, is in Latin, God will vindicate, uh, mm. right? Um, it's this mm. very, very overt, you know, thing of like, yeah, you know, what these things that Jefferson Davis stood for and the Confederacy stood for, the, we lost the war, slavery's been abolished. But ultimately, God is going to vindicate our cause. I mean, that is the lost cause. You know, we still have, um, you know, a thousand or so and some change uh, Confederate monuments on public property um, around mm -hmm. the country. And, and the reason they're on public property and not on private land or private cemeteries is, is precisely because they were meant to be these declarations of defiance um, and declarations of vindication. Um, and they were there to kind of remind the next generation and the generation after that that if you walk past the courthouse and you saw this big monument to a Confederate soldier, it was a reminder, particularly to African Americans. Um, look, don't forget who's really in charge here. Like we lost the war, but if you want to know what kind of justice you're going to get in the court you're about to walk into, just look up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, mm -hmm. it was that kind of a reminder, and that's why they are there on those big public squares, courthouse lawns. I mean, they're there very much. I, I'd say that's one thing we really have with us, and I think if we understand. The history, right? That those monuments weren't really put there uh, at the ter at, during the Civil War or even immediately after. Most of those monuments were put there in the 1920s and the 1950s, at times when uh, the country was reeling over. In the 1920s, it's when the South is 
standing up all these Jim Crow laws and clawing back the um, voting advances from Reconstruction. Uh, in the 1950s, it's, it's the fights over uh, desegregating uh, public spaces and public schools. And that's when more of these monuments go up. They are a direct mm -hmm. response to uh, when you see kind of progress on, on black equality, you see more monuments going up. Wow. I mean, and, and so you know, I, th I think that you're making the point again, very importantly, that there are these histories and connections that we have to pay attention to that when the monuments were erected, what were they in either response to or in support of that may have now be lost in the historical record. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. So, you know, um, in terms of the work that Tannenbaum does, I'm sure that there are a number of people participating today and who will look at this recording. Um, we do our work with corporate workplaces and large non-for-profits in the healthcare space, in the space of diplomacy and peace building. And I wonder if you could just give us your thoughts on, you know, balancing um, one's religious identity with perhaps their racial identity. Intersectionality is something that we do a great deal of work around. And we're in uh, a very political season at this particular moment. Um, uh, emotions are running quite high. There are a number of very key issues at stake. I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about how you see this work of addressing the impact of supremacy on Christianity impacting these areas. Yeah, well, I want to say, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm, you know, I'm so happy that we at PRI has been able to partner with, with you all at Tannenbaum is because, I mean, this work that you're describing has never been more important. It's never been more difficult. It's never been more important. <laughs> um, you know, one of, one of the challenges is that, um, and I think, you know, just from a, like whatever side of the political divide, you know, partisan divide one finds oneself on, I think if we are all, if we step back and we kind of look at the ways that these forces have combined, you know, we ought to all be quite worried, uh, really. Um, the, and and I'm, I'm certainly troubled as I kind of see these patterns, because what has happened um, in the country, particularly, I think, in the last 30, 40 years, we've had this kind of gradual alignment of these very powerful forces of racial identity and ethnic identity on the one hand, partisan identity on the other, and religious identity uh, on the other, if I can have three hands, uh, kind of mess up my metaphor here, but um, uh, I'll borrow one of yours. Um, uh, but the, uh, uh, the third hand, um, but, the, but, but what this means is that today, um, more often than not, these are all pulling in the same direction. And in fact, they've been, hard, they've been captured in many ways by partisanship, which has become one of those powerful forces in our society. Um, so just to give you an example, you know, today, um, one of the reasons why we have such visceral conflicts between Democrats and Republicans is because the racial and religious identity of the two parties has become very much a, a different from one another. So if you look at the Republican Party today, for example, it has become the home. Uh, it, it's it's um, two thirds white and Christian. In fact, it's like one th uh, more than a third is just white evangelical. Right. So it's a very homogeneous uh, party. You look at the Democratic Party. Um, it's only one third white and Christian today. And this gap has gotten bigger over the, you know, as the decades have, have kind of gone on. Um, and so it's, it's maybe not that surprising that, you know, some of the biggest arguments we're having aren't over a particular policy, but they're over who we are as a country, right? It's like they're over identity. Mm -hmm. who, who, what does it mean to be an American? Who gets to be an American? Um, what, is it, what does an American look like, right? And sound like? I mean, these are the biggest divides that we have. And I think it's because of this, this kind of dynamic. So I think, you know, any work that is allowing us to kind of, you know, break down these lines, right, and kind of come together, talk to each other across these lines, I mean, ultimately it's gonna be good for everyone. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think it's, uh, the challenges I do think, and I, you know, I, I wrote this book particularly for um, white Christians who, who I think have been largely in denial um, over their role, um, really, in protecting white supremacy and promoting white supremacy. And I do think one of the hard, places um, that we're in is that there has to be um, more of a truth telling than we've really had. And, and I, I think that that you're right, some of this has been hidden as we talked about. But I think the only way to really get to a place of healing and honesty with each other, I mean, and that's what at the end of the day, what we've got to find, if we're really going to have a pluralistic, multiracial democracy, we've got to find a way to tell the truth about our history, um, so that we can kind of find some you know, places of healing and justice and move forward together in a better, 
way. But I think the, the first part of that, I mean, the end of that sounds great, where we're going to kind of put our arms around each other, or we're going to, you know, maybe be better together. Um, but but the, I think where we are right now is a much harder place, which I think mm -hmm. is why this work, you know, is, is so important, because it is hard. Uh, because the reckoning piece of this um, is really difficult work. It, it, it is, it's, it's hard because I think on, on, if you're on the, if you're not white, um, you're a kind of religious minority or a, a racial ethnic minority in, in the country, um, having patience uh, with white people and Christian people as we stumble along here and at a snail's pace, I think is often kind of, you know, uh, crazy making. And, um, and, and if you're a white Christian, it is not easy to sit with this history. I mean, I, there were plenty of times where I was literally in tears as I was typing, you know, things on the page that needed to be said that I needed to make sure were out there. And I just, there were some sentences I stared at. I just couldn't believe that I was writing, you know, yeah. um, but it was true. Um, and just realizing that it, it's kind of a medicine, I think we're at that point where we're taking the medicine where we're in chemo, right? Where it really sucks. You know, it, it's, um, it's, it's hard, um, it, it's painful. Uh, but if we're going to get to health, we got to walk through it. This is the yeah. part that we've got to walk through. And so I, I think that's why the work you, know, you all and others are doing is so important right now, because we need that extra support and guidance to get us through this difficult time. If we're ever going to get to the, you know, the, the thing we can see on the horizon. Um, out yeah. there. Well, there are a number of questions that are coming into the Q&A box, as you can imagine. I want to turn to those questions. Uh, and then I do want to make sure that we and then I'll just ask you now to begin thinking about um, where are you encouraged in uh, while we're mm -hmm. here in the operating room, uh, no anesthetic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to reset bone and, and uh, operate, um, where are you finding encouragement? But before we get to that, let me try and ask some of these questions. So the first one says, as a lifelong person of faith who grew up in the Protestant tradition in the northern part of the country, I disagree with your assessment of a personal relationship with Jesus, meaning that someone is not one who would take action against racism. I think this is a gross overgeneralization. How do you reconcile the verse that says faith without works is dead? That Jesus loves all people, that Jesus created all people, that God's love extends to all people. In my experience, people of faith are generally those who are most passionate and active in taking positive action against racism. How would you? Yeah, um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, so I think one of the downsides of the Zoom kind of format is that you know we can't really have a conversation. Um, uh, I'd say a couple of things. So I, I don't, I don't know how accurate this will be, but but I'll I'll say this for I'll I'll say this for myself. When I have felt, because uh, what I'm sensing a little bit is some defensiveness in that question, right? And, and so I would say when I have felt that in myself, uh, I have tried very hard to sit with it, right? Um, and to say, okay, where's the defensiveness coming from? What am I defending? Why am I defending it? Um, and so I just kind of want to say, like, I've had to sit with that a lot, right? And try to be as non-defensive as I can right now about, about that. And, and I think it's really important I think for, for people who are kind of part of the kind of more dominant, you know, power structure to do is to really sit with, wow, okay, I'm feeling really defensive right now. What does that mean? Um, what's going on with me? Why is that? Where's it coming from? And, and it kind of just, just not, not dismiss it uh, too quickly. Um, so all that's to say, you know, what, what's notable, I think, about um, like some of the, the scriptural passages that, um, that the, the questioner cited there, I mean, sure, I mean, all of that's, in, in, the, in the biblical text, it's, it's all there, right? Um, but I, I think the question is, what use, you know, did um, many, you know, white Christian churches make of that, you know, stuff? You know, and I can certainly tell you that, um, you know, from other sociological studies and congregational studies, I mean, including studies of preaching and homiletics, um, you know, the African-American Christian tradition makes much more use of the book of Exodus, uh, for example, than, than most white Christian traditions do. Um, for, I think, fairly obvious you know, reasons. And you know, to, type, to cite a really extreme example, um, you know, there, I talk about this in the book. I mean, there was actually a, a Bible developed um, by a British missionary society um, that was made to be used with ministers working with enslaved people in the British West Indies. Um, and notably, um, it was an abridged Bible, 
And one of the things they did was, you know, to kind of cut it down. Uh, but it wasn't just for convenience and portability. Um, it was actually for content. And so if you ask what's in there and what's not, um, what's in there, um, interestingly enough, they left the books of, of Exodus in, but they excised the end of it, right? So um, the, uh, the Ten Commandments are there, all things about obeying. Um, the, uh, the enslavement of the Israelites is there, but missing from the end of the book is the namesake of the book. The, the Exodus is not there. Like the liberation of the slaves are not there. Um, mm -hmm. And in the New Testament, um, some of these passages um, you know, that you cite are not there. Like Ephesians, slaves obey your masters, that's there. But Galatians, uh, in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek, no slave nor free, not there. Uh, right. And so, I mean, this was a very explicit way that um, the, the text was, you know, selectively used. And if you think about, you know, I, th I think the other ways, and it may be that the questioner was, you know, part of a church um, that was uh, an exception to the rule. Uh, but certainly, I think what you can see is both in the contemporary public opinion data today um, and in the history, um, by no means um, did white Christian churches as a, as a mass stand up on the side of civil rights. It just didn't happen. Uh, King, King was, you know, appalled by this. James Baldwin was appalled by this. Frederick Douglass was appalled by this way back uh, in the 19th century. Um, and it's just something that has never, um, there were, sure, there were leaders who stood up, uh, but, but white Christians as a whole never stood up um, uh, on the side of civil rights, um, you know, in any mass in any mass way, and you never see this in public opinion surveys um, as a whole either. So I think there's clearly, even if you can kind of hold up an example or two, or even a denomination that did better than others. Um, but I, one last point on this, I will point out, like the United Methodists, for example, put out a lot of great statements uh, on racial justice. They were, the Methodist building in DC serves as a staging ground for King's March on Washington. Uh, they had Martin Luther King um, as, uh, as actually the, um, uh, an editor on, in the Christian Century. Uh, it was a mainline uh, pro uh, publication. In fact, the Christian Century is a place that published letter from Birmingham jail first. Uh, but even as the Methodist building was like serving as um, this hub for organizing uh, for civil rights, um, uh, and, and the Episcopalians in, uh, and uh, were also putting out great statements, uh, even as all that was happening in the mainline Protestant world at the national level, um, at the very same time, in the same year, um, King's uh, own son was denied admission to an Episcopal uh, private school in Atlanta on the basis of his race, right? So these things were happening at the same time. There's a big yeah. difference between the kind of denominational statements and where the mass of people in the pews were as well. Great, thank you so much. So our next question uh, comes from Dr. Zara Jamal um, from the Boniac Institute uh, at uh, Rice University. She says, thanks for a great conversation. Recent surveys and studies on this topic state that non-whites and non-Christians also uphold the beliefs, values, and practices of white Christian Americanism. What do you make of these claims? Are they legitimate expressions of identity that we must uphold as part of inclusion and equity? Or do you feel non-whites non-Christians have been duped and must be educated out of ignorance? Well, a um, little difficult without knowing exactly what study we're, we're talking about. I um, mean, I can say, I guess I'll just kind of say the general patterns we do, you know, we do see in the data, particularly around um, systemic racism concerning, concerning African Americans, specifically there, uh, all that holds up actually on immigration attitudes as well, but, uh, but specifically there, we do see this pattern of um, you know, white Christians over here uh, and, uh, and whites who are unaffiliated here and non-white Christians way over here, um, right? So much lower levels there. I mean, there are certainly cases, and I've been on conversation with African-American pastors, for example, who, you know, have said they've had huge fights in their own churches over, uh, like, one, one talked about removing a portrait of a white Jesus uh, from the halls of their church. Um, another one talked about... Um, uh, uh, not using Sunday school material from the Southern Baptist Convention, which mostly depicted white kids, right? And the illustrations and the, uh, the stuff that didn't have a very diverse, um, you know, view of, uh, of things. So I think, I think it is certainly there has been some bleed over effect. And I think the dominance really of white evangelicalism, particularly in American culture, um, has meant that it's diffused in many ways, just not just 
it's diffused out into American culture, you know, writ large, I think, in some ways that I think, you know, this, this kind of reckoning, if we, if we kind of have the courage to do it, is going to have to be not just inside kind of religious organizations, but how, but kind of facing how that is kind of diffused in more, um, you know, subtle ways, even outside the, outside those walls. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's interesting because I would think about, um, you know, I, I went to a Presbyterian church when I was a child and there was a depiction of Jesus as white in that church. And I don't know if it's changed, but that, that was a part of, if you will, the theology that was placed before us. And so, and, and that would have been late, uh, late 60s, early 70s that I was attending that church, baptized there, the whole thing. So it's kind of like, again, the water that you're introduced to, and then there would, in mid 70s, late 70s and going forward, there would then be not just personal challenges to this, but then kind of scholarship that arises and new information that comes out and that kind of thing. Let me go on to this next question um, from Sadaf Parvez. So great to have you on the conversation with us, Sadaf. Her question is, what caused Robbie to interrogate his upbringing, especially mm -hmm. since he was so insulated and everything he was taught to believe was reinforced by the environment around him? This is amazing that he is questioning his own background, religious affiliation, and even family. Yeah, well, I appreciate that question. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of thinking about that, actually. Um, I, I think a couple of things. Um, one, I do think, despite the fact that, um, you know, my parents were, they weren't very political. I think we were all kind of in this world together. I do think that they very deliberately put some space between my siblings and I, and I think the generation before them in terms of uh, just overt expressions of racism. And I, and I think we saw them doing that, which just put a little placeholder um, there. Um, I think the other thing is um, some courageous teachers uh, in, in seminary. It was in a Southern Baptist seminary that I first learned the story of the origins of our denomination. It was a professor called Leon Macbeth, who was the first Baptist historian actually to put in a textbook that, that um, supporting slavery was the primary reason for the formation of the of the convention. That that textbook wasn't published until the 1980s. Um, so you know that was pretty recent um, that even Baptist historians were admitting, um, you know, openly this this history. So I think it's like little little things like that. I think were cracks in the door, um, you know. And and then I think the thing that really pushed me to put pen to paper. Um, I mean, certainly I could say my my time at Emory University um, as well. Uh, where, you know, was exposed to liberation theology and other, you know, other uh, kind of different takes, certainly, than I got, um, mm -hmm. you know, growing up, and different ways of reading the Bible, different ways of thinking about the tradition. Um, but I, I think the thing that pushed me to, you know, really was these overt acts of, of violence um, in, in the last five years, you know, really, uh, from, you know, the early kind of, uh, kind of protests around the Black Lives Matter movement, with Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, um, to, uh, in particularly, uh, the, the killing of nine worshipers at Mother Emanuel AME in Charleston uh, by Dylan Roof. Um, and I, that one in particular shook me because when I dug into that more, um, you know, Dylan Roof was a, a, an ELCA Lutheran. Um, he was a mainline Protestant Lutheran, a baptized Lutheran in good standing at a local church, um, and, and, and who actually saw his kind of white supremacist, you know, philosophical view as completely compatible with his Christian uh, worldview. And, and, and when I looked at, for example, at the journal that he um, wrote when he was in prison after he had committed the murders and was waiting trial, um, you know, he was writing this manifesto, this kind of white supremacist manifesto, which was the press, the mainstream press that reported on. What they didn't report on was that he had doodled all through the thing, all these Christian symbols, like most of the doodling was crosses, full page a thing of a cross and one very startling one was a full page um, sketch, a very detailed one of a white Jesus emerging resurrected from the tomb, right? With this kind of a lot of iconography that you would see in Orthodox Christianity. So very familiar with Christian iconography uh, there. And, but I think that one, and then I think there was, there's also Charlottesville, uh, you know, with white supremacists rallying around a Confederate statue and, sh and, and shouting, Jews will not replace us, and these other blood and soil, these other neo-Nazi, you know, slogans. So that I think the fact that these things have come so uh, out from under the surface and, and, you know, right in front of us, 
um, I, I think has, has been part of what's really pushed me to try to, you know, think about a, a truer story. And again, not just, you know, I, I'm right, the first work, the first sentence in this book has the word I in it. The last sentence in this book has the word us in it. I mean, this is not a, I'm not standing outside throwing rocks. I mean, this is really, um, I think, a, a bid for my own tradition to come to a healthier, more faithful place at the end of the day. I mean, it, it's, it's it, I, I certainly wouldn't have written this book if I didn't care. Um, about uh, the state of um, of American Christianity, particularly white white American uh, Christianity. So I, I I'd say it's written from a, a great place of love and concern, um, you know, and and hopefully by charting a little bit of my own journey, which I should say is like painfully slow, right? I mean, I was in my twenties when I first kind of got this history, and it's kind of sat with me for three decades, you know. Now, I mean, it's it's been a long a long journey, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and and. In, you know, longer than I would like to think um, it, it would have taken, but um, but hopefully, by kind of being honest about that and kind of putting it out there, it can help. I think others kind of you know take a few steps down this path as well. So it looks like I'm I may be able to get one more question in um, before we end, and trust me, I'm I'm just going in the order in which they're coming in. So I apologize to those questions that we have not been able to get to. Um, this question says, thank you for engaging us on this. White supremacy is complex and it can be difficult to engage white people on it. One difficulty is distinguishing people, uh, parentheses, and their perceived race or skin color from culture. How would you address white Christians who do not believe that whites are inherently superior, but who perceive that the culture they cherish, social norms, music, music and art, laws and views of criminal justice, religious freedom, for many people, free market economics, etc., is changing in a direction they don't like and therefore want to preserve it. How can we have more nuanced conversations on these topics? Yeah, well, there's a lot there. Um, I'll try to kind of get to, I think, what I think is the heart of the matter um, on this is that, you know, in the book, I, I um, Kind of hold up this real paradox um and again the kind of i'll just take one example from my own uh kind of tradition for the evangelical world that i grew up in um that that white evangelicals simultaneously if, if you ask well, so say, if you ask people um about how warmly they feel toward african americans and other groups we have a kind of battery question say how warmly do you feel toward and we have fill in the blank with a, a bunch of, other, of groups that have historically faced some discrimination in the country african americans one of the things on the list um, and we asked that question about African Americans. White evangelicals are among the the those who score the highest on this this warm, feeling thermometer of war, cold and warm, right? So uh, they're they're very likely uh, to uh, to to say that they feel warmly toward African Americans. At the same time, they score the highest on the racism index, which is measuring views around systemic racism. So I think this is one of the struggles. Um, is that um, many white evangelicals and white Christians in general will respond, well, I don't hold any ill will toward anyone who's not white. I don't, you know, or I'm colorblind. I don't think about people in terms of color. Like, you know, those kinds of, of, of responses, I think, can be true. Um, and it is still true um, that there is this inability to, and unwillingness, really. I think it's both. I think it is a kind of motivated reasoning um, as well as a kind of cultural limitation and theological limitation because of the theological and cultural tools that white evangelicals have at their disposal that does kind of screen everything down to individual things as a very difficult time seeing systemic injustice um, in the country. It, it renders it in somewhat invisible uh, to them. And so I, I think it takes a little while of unpacking it. But I mean, one of the things I, I would say is this, is look, um, to, to white Christians to maybe open up some space uh, is, is this, I don't think there's very many white Christians who would look at the history of this country and say that we mostly got it right on the issue of racial justice, right? Most white Christians are on the wrong side of slavery. Most white Christians are on the wrong side of civil rights uh, and segregation. Um, we'd like to think we get it right now, but, but I think historically, you know, we, we mostly have not got it right. Uh, given that history, um, here's what I would say, like, might it be the appropriate thing that when we see our African-American brothers and sisters in pain and anguish and angry over something like police killing of African Americans, unarmed African Americans, that rather than pronouncing, oh, well, all lives matter, blue lives matter, white lives matter, these kind of retorts, having gotten it so wrong for centuries, 
it seems like maybe a little more humility might be in order on our parts um, that we would, even if we don't get it, right, even if we don't get it, that we would sit with it long enough to try to kind of make it make sense, right, to kind of see if we can muster enough empathy to grant the legitimacy of those feelings and those reactions and then try to think, okay, well, what's going on there to really ask that question, sit with it long enough to where we might get another, um, you know, or, um, and um, have some conversations with some African American people we trust and say, look, I'm really struggling with this. Like, I don't get it. Like, help me, help me understand what's going on here. But, but putting ourselves in that position, I think, uh, so that something different can erupt and, and being motivated that by that, by not wanting to get it so wrong again, right? Given that we've had this kind of history of, of just not being able to see um, things, I think, very accurately when it comes to racial justice issues. And so, I mean, that would be my plea. And, and that can really be motivated, you know, we have to kind of get out of our defensive boxes and kind of get, you know, get to be, I mean, really can be motivated by love. Like if, if I mean, I, I kind of feel like most of what I've written in the book really comes down to two things. Um, tell the truth and love your neighbor, right? And if you can kind of boil it down to that, we need to tell the truth. We need to be honest about our past and how it's gotten us to where we are. And two, we need to love our neighbors. And that's going to mean our African-American neighbors. Um, that, and we, it's going to mean maybe trying to kind of broaden our, our view to see something we currently don't see. So Robbie, um, we are at our hour. I did want to end though and give you the opportunity to just say, um, what do you find encouraging? What still encourages I'm so glad. you in the midst yes. of all this? I'm glad we're ending on this. Um, uh, I kind of wrote it down to make sure we didn't miss it. Um, I, I am encouraging. In fact, I, I'm actually more encouraged. Um, so I turned in the manuscript for this book a year ago. Um, and I am more encouraged today than I was a year ago. Um, uh, turning this book in. Now, a couple of examples um, I'll give you are um, one uh, from my home state of Mississippi. Um, I would not have imagined when I turned this book in last September um, that my home state uh, would have voted to remove the Confederate battle flag from the state flag. Uh, that has been up on the ballot a number of times. 19 years ago, it was on the ballot. And not only that, but that one of the key groups in the state that pushed the governor and the legislature to do it was the Mississippi Baptist Convention. That's the, that's the state arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. So that the denomination that was founded to defend slavery actually stood up in 2020 and said, uh, yeah, we'd like to um, call on the governor uh, to remove the Confederate battle flag. And, that, and that it's gone, right? I would not, couldn't yeah. imagine that would be gone by the time we're having this conversation a year later. And then the other quick thing is um, the monuments in Richmond. I, I think I spent, you know, a, a few weeks in Richmond doing research for the book. And, and every day I would, I would walk Monument Avenue. I'd walk past these five massive uh, monuments to the Confederacy. And four of the five statues at the center of those monuments are gone, uh, torn down over the summer. The fifth one is slated for removal, just tied up in kind of legal wranglings. But it, it's not a matter of uh, if, it's a matter of when. Um, that statue of Robert E. Lee will be removed. Um, and, you know, they're spray painted with Black Lives Matter slogans. I mean, those, those statues have stood there for a hundred years and they were put up around the turn of the 20th century, most of them. Um, and I, I wouldn't imagine that, that most of them would be gone um, again. And one, one quick little tidbit here is um, that uh, there's, a, there's a Baptist church actually on, on one of the traffic circles uh, uh, to Andrew Jackson. And when that monument was, was removed, um, that that uh, one of the congregation members said, said, "Can we ring the bell to celebrate the removal mm. of this of this statue?" And they wow. did. Um, now, notably, that bell um, has been in that church's possession for over 150 years, and it was actually the same bell that that church, the same church, offered to the Confederacy to be melted down to create cannon. Uh, and, and and during the Civil War, now they didn't do it, so the bell's still there. But I think that arc, seeing that arc, right, of a bell that was offered to create cannons to defend slavery uh, by a church uh, is rung in celebration of a Confederate monument coming down in 2020. I, I'm I really encouraged really uh, by that. Now, we have, the, I think we still have the work. Uh, these symbols are coming down. We still have the cultural work to do um, to dismantle, I think, the white supremacy that was there that kind of supported the erection of these monuments in the first place. But I think the, the symbols coming down are um, notable and um, remarkable even. Uh, first, you know, first step uh, that I think is a good clue for us to kind of dig in and do the cultural work to finish, finish the job. Great. 
Robbie, thank you so much for making the time to be with us again. Uh, Robert B. Jones, author of uh, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. I'm sure you can find the book if you have not already on all platforms. Uh, we are tannenbaum.org for any information that we can be helpful with. Again, our social media handles are at Tannenbaum Center on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, please use uh, our hashtag include religion, all one word. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon. And the recording, for those of you who have been asking, the recording of this conversation will be on our YouTube page in a couple of days. And we will notify everyone through our email blast to let you know when it's available. Thank you, Robbie. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Mark. Glad to be here.